脱サラってなんで初めから呪術師になんなかったんですかまずは挨拶でしょうはじめましてイタドリ君あはいはじめまして私が高専で学び気づいたことは呪術師はクソということですあ<音楽>Jujutsu Kaisen, a series that has taken the world by storm in the past year and easily has one of the best plots in shonen manga. Akutami has a potential masterpiece in his hands, and it all falls down to the sort of direction he'll take the series because at the moment, with each chapter, there is no slowing down and things only get more interesting and exciting with every passing week. But I'm certain that there is one thing that so many of us have been very confused about, and that is the timeline of this vast series. The dates and timeline of certain events in Jujutsu Kaisen does get a little confusing at times, and that is why I'm creating this video, where we go through every single event in Jujutsu Kaisen according to the date and time which it occurred. If I'm being honest, I'm making this video more for myself, since things do get a little complicated in Jujutsu Kaisen. So we'll be going through JJK in order and how Akutami has laid it all out. But before we do so, be sure to subscribe to the channel if you are new and hit the notification bell to stay updated on my latest uploads. This video will certainly contain spoilers from the manga. Also, we've also recently created a Jujutsu Kaisen community on Twitter, so if you're into anything and everything JJK, be sure to join it. The link will be in the description below. This video is sponsored by Fandomaniacs. So, what exactly is Fandomaniacs? Well, it's a store which specifically caters to us anime fans, and with their help, I was able to produce this video you guys are watching now. Anyway, Since the majority of us here are Jujutsu Kaisen and Demon Slayer fans, this store has some really cool merch of the series. I know it's quite hard to find some quality Jujutsu Kaisen clothing anywhere, but I can assure you these guys have some really good taste, which is also affordable. They've recently put out some new clothing, including the famous Sorcerer Trio, Yuji, Gojo, and Megami. Another one of my favorites would have to be the Jujutsu Kaisen Bomber Jacket, where you can customize your own name onto it. Not only do they have Jujutsu Kaisen, I know that even Demon Slayer merch is hard to come by. They've got some Really cool t shirts and even jackets. But for those who aren't interested in Jujutsu Kaisen or Demon Slayer, they've got a wide variety of anime clothing, such as Tokyo Revengers, Attack on Titan, One Piece, and many more. If you guys are interested, I've got my own little cool discount code, Arzin10, to get the merch for much cheaper. The link will be down in the description below. This will also support me massively in making future content. But, anyways, let's get right back into the video. As for this timeline video, we will run through every single lock until the latest one, which is The Culling Games. So, all you have to do is piece the puzzle together and truly understand how the world of JJK functions. I'm sure we're all curious as to when the specific dates for the golden era of shamans occurred, as well as the time in which Gojo's past had taken place. On top of that, we'll also go over the Shibuya incident thoroughly, so prepare yourselves for that. But, anyways, why don't we dissect every little bit of Jujutsu Kaisen? Well, to begin this lengthy video off, we'll need to go all the way back to the Nara period, which was between the years 710 to 794. Now, as for what occurred back then, it was when Master Tengen began preaching the idea of Jujutsu and how there should be a system in place to protect non sorcerers and humans. What we all have to keep in mind is back then, during the Nara period, which was basically over a thousand years ago compared to the series' current timeline. This statement was shown in chapter 74 of the manga during the Hidden Inventory arc, where a member Of the Time Vessel Association explained how the group came to existence, and that was, of course, during the Nara period, which I mentioned earlier. During this era, it was Master Tengen's heydays, as well as the world being entrenched into chaos due to the abuse of Jujutsu abilities. So, if Master Tengen had not brought upon a system to protect the weak ones and non sorcerers, then the entire world would have been filled with cursed spirits. Now, we'll go a little further down the timeline, and that is the famous Heian period, the time in which was classified as the Golden Age of Shamans. Where the advancement of Jujutsu was basically at its highest. And the next little fact is the reason why. Well, during the Heian period, which took place from the years 794 to 1185, a Jujutsu sorcerer named Ashiya Sadatsuna. Had created a game changing technique which would be used almost 1000 years later by Mekomaru in his battle against Mahito. That was, of course, the simple domain. This was the first technique to be able to counter one's domain expansion from within as it creates a defensive barrier around them, which was seen when Mekomaru used it against Mahito's self embodiment of perfection. We even got to see the likes of Kasumi Miwa use it against Maki during the Kyoto Goodwill event arc and Meimei's younger brother Wiwi during the Shibuya incident arc. The creator known as Ashia. 
guess that Atsuna created the simple domain, but it also goes to show how fast the world of Jujutsu was developing during the Heian period, where he needed to create such a technique. In other words, there must have been some insane sorcerers around casually just whipping out their domain expansions, so Ashia needed to create something to counter it. Well, as for this next one, a lot of us already know what's coming. So between the years 1000 to 1018, which was still during the Heian period, this was when all the strongest shamans managed to seal the king of all curses, Ryomen Sukuna. It was said when Yuji consumed the fingers that Sukuna was sealed 1000 years ago, and at the time it was 2018. So when you put two and two together, you get the times between 1000 and 1018 just to be on the safe side. So when Jujutsu was at its peak, this was also when Ryomen Sukuna was sealed and ultimately separated into 20 different fingers. He also gained the title of King of All Curses. As he was that powerful, it needed the strongest shamans during the Golden Age to simply seal him away. Like can you imagine? They couldn't even fully kill him but were forced to seal him away and thus the legend of Ryomen Sukuna would live on. After a staggering 800 or 900 odd years, which is between 1868 to 1912, during the Meiji period, a man by the name of Norotoshi Kamo creates nine different death painting rooms, but what we understand from the current events in Jujutsu Kaisen is that Norotoshi Kamo was simply a brain called Kenjaku plotting away. So it's said that Kenjaku created these death painting rooms in the Meiji period, but obviously it could have taken him much longer to understand, experiment and research how to literally create a hybrid breed between human and cursed spirit. From my point of view, these death paintings are a taboo in the world of Jujutsu, since Kenjaku was simply playing Dr. Frankenstein and experimenting with life. His motives behind the creations of the death painting rooms are still unclear. Moving on to the 7th of December 1989, a date so famous it became a historic event in the world of Jujutsu. The balance of the world began to tip and that was when Satoru Gojo was born. This was shown in chapter 96 with a baby Gojo on the cover slowly opening his eyes, revealing the six eyes. Another reason why it became a much more historical event was because Gojo was the first person in just over 100 years to possess the six eyes and also the Gojo family's limitless technique. And from then on, Gojo was set on by plenty of bounty hunters, as it was said that Kenjaku had previously lost to two Six Eyes users in the past, and had even murdered another Six Eyes user a month after they were born, going to show how much fear he had against such an ability. So of course, Kenjaku probably tried everything in his power to kill a baby Gojo, but simply failed. Six years later, on the year of 1996, it seems an 18 or 19 year old Toji went to visit a six year old Gojo. This was revealed in chapter 7 during the hidden inventory arc. As Toji states, I once went to see the Gojo kid with the six eyes, to see what all the fuss was about. It was the first and last time anyone was aware of my presence when I stood behind them. Toji during this was seen with a confused face when a kid Gojo stared straight at him with his six eyes. So can you imagine being so famous from a young age that even the Toji had to come and meet him? Funnily enough, six years after Toji had gone to meet Gojo to see what all the fuss was about, our main character was introduced into the world. Yuji Itadori was born on 20th of March 2002. As for Yuji's origins, we understand his father was manipulated and his mother was none other than Kenjaku. And of course, Yuji was also a death painting room since he was the product of Kenjaku. It was shown in chapter 143 where Wasuke Itadori Yuji's grandfather was concerned about his son and the mother of his child. We saw a vague scar on Yuji's mother's head and then it was later revealed that Kanjaku is the parent of Yuji, but Yuji's creation is still not totally revealed, with some of us even a little confused. Maybe Yuji is a special kind of death painting room, but who knows. Anyways, I think we're all just glad that Yuji was born, otherwise we wouldn't have had Jujutsu Kaisen. Well, it's time to dive in on one of the biggest arcs which Jujutsu Kaisen provided for us, and that is of course the hidden inventory arc. Gojo Gojo's past was explained in the year of 2006, as it all begins with a much younger Mei Mei and Utahime figuring their way through a cursed mansion. Where the corridor they are in is basically an infinite loop causing them to go round and round in circles. Once the pair were about to test their strategy out, the entire mansion begins to cave in with a high schooler Gojo saying I came to help you. He then looks down on Utahime in the rubble, who at the time doesn't have the scar on her face, as seen in the present timeline, and asks her if she is crying with a smirk on his face. Of course, Utahime pissed off tells him that she's not crying and wants him to respect his elders. It was revealed that in the year 2006, Satoru Gojo was a second year high schooler, meaning he was around the age of 16 to 17, whereas Utahime would have been between the age of 18 and 19. Anyways, we were also shown the grade in which each of them were placed in. Utahime was a grade 2 sorcerer and Meimei was a grade 1 sorcerer. 
This is when we see a rare moment of Utahime using her curse technique, which surprisingly hasn't been revealed yet. And that was when she almost commanded a cursed spirit to attack Gojo. That is when Suguru Geto arrives onto the scene and tames Utahime's cursed spirit, saying to Gojo that it's not nice to pick on the weak. Shoko Iyeri then appears, saying how they got worried for Meimei and Utahime since they were gone for two days. Utahime hugs Shoko, then questioning the idea of two days, realizing that they were stuck in a barrier which was messing around with time. That is when Meimei asks if they place down a curtain before absolutely demolishing the place, but in Gojo fashion, they realized they didn't, which caused the whole country to see the wreckage being broadcasted on the news and blaming one of the old pipes to be the result of this unexpected explosion. Funnily enough, the three were scolded by their teacher at the time and that was Masamichi Yaga, who was a grade 1 sorcerer back then. Gojo goes on to question why should they even put curtains up in the first place and saying, does it even matter if regular people see us? It's not like they can see cursed spirits or jutsu anyways. That's when Geto's rational thinking comes into place telling Gojo they must do so to keep the peace of minds of the civilians. Gojo thought the idea of protecting the weak to be such a pain, however Geto's mindset was the opposite, believing that Jujutsu sorcerers must protect the weak, but Gojo counters it by saying how he hated people acting all righteous. Gojo and Geto going back and forth with their little argument, but then about to heat things up. However, Masamichi Yaga steps into the classroom, and the two have no choice but to act all friendly with each other again. Masamichi Yaga goes on to explain a specific mission for these two 16 year olds, telling them to find the Star Plasma vessel, which is the perfect vessel for Master Tengen, and escort her back to the high school. This is where things may get a little complicated, so keep up. Master Tengen is known as the Immortal Sorcerer, the one who remains under Jujutsu High in the star corridor and keeps all the jujutsu barriers around the world in check, making sure the world isn't overrun by cursed spirits. But there's a catch and that is Master Tengen needs a new body every 500 years where he rewrites his memories into the new vessel and then they carry out the duties for another 500 years. But they'll need a star plasma vessel, a very rare person who can take on the memories of the immortal sorcerer. But if Master Tengen doesn't find a suitable vessel after his time is up, then it could cause him to completely lose control and purpose and evolve, becoming an evil entity much scarier than Sukuna. Anyways, Master Michiyaga explains how there are two specific groups in the way of escorting this star plasma vessel back to the high school, the first group being called Group Q, as they are a group of cursed users and want Master Tengen to lose control and reason, meaning they don't want him to get a new vessel. The second group is called Time Vessel Association, where these guys worship Master Tengen as a god and believe that he also shouldn't have a new vessel since they don't want him to be tainted. So by this logic, these two groups do not want anyone to replace the current Master Tengen due to their different ideologies. That's when Master Michiyaga assigns these high schoolers with probably the biggest mission at the time, but this star plasma vessel who they needed to escort is a middle school girl named Riko Amanai. As both Gojo and Geto arrive at the apartment building where the star plasma vessel is based, an explosion seems to go off at the top floor, noticing a soldier from Group Q throwing Riko Amanai off. This soldier is called Kokun, but as Riko Amanai falls off to her inevitable death, she's caught by Suguru Geto with ease, gliding around on one of his cursed spirits which he manipulates. Kokun threatens Geto to hand back Riko Amanai or he'd kill him, but Geto doesn't really care whatsoever. Gojo looks from the ground up, letting Geto deal with the ensuing havoc, but he is then struck by various knives, which he stops in midair using his limitless technique. The soldier he was put up against is known as Veya. He rambles on about how famous Gojo is and that he has heard Gojo was pretty strong. The battle between Gojo and Veya begins, but we are then switched to a much different scenery, witnessing two men gazing at the ongoing battles from a different building. We are then introduced to two specific characters, the first character known as Shiyu Kong, who works for the Time Vessel Association, they are the ones who pray to Master Tengen as a god. Shiyu Kong asks this mystery man if he can complete a bounty for the TVA and that is to kill the Star Plasma Vessel. Shiyu calls him a Zenin. The man then replies with, I got married and took my wife's name, I go by Fushiguro now. To which we are all introduced to the famous Toji Fushiguro, the father of Megami Fushiguro. Anywho, we then switch back to seeing Q soldier Kokun stuck inside the mouth of one of Geto's cursed spirits and then Gojo casually sending a photo of himself with a beaten down Veya and showing it to Kokun. Then it was revealed that Veya was their strongest soldier and Group Q immediately disbanded after their defeat to Gojo and Geto. Shortly after, Shiyu Kong goes to meet Toji at a horse racing event and notices that Toji was busy betting away. Asking Toji what he's been up to, Toji explains his plan letting Shiyu understand that he's dealing with the Gojo King. 
kid and that it wouldn't be an easy task at all. I mean someone like Toji acknowledging this teenager should tell you how strong Gojo was even during his earlier years. By the way just a little fun fact, Toji was known as a sorcerer killer where he accepted bounties to kill all sorts of sorcerers so practically at this moment in time he was probably the strongest around. Shu asked Toji how Megami was doing and Toji replies with who's that again. During all this Gojo and Geto get to finally talk to the star plasma vessel which we know as Riko Amanai. She jumps up thinking Gojo and Geto are there to kidnap her but realizes that they are on her side when seeing her maid Misato Kuroi riding on top of Geto's cursed spirit. That's when Riko spouts on about her being Master Tengen and of course Gojo and Geto casually showing each other their new phone wallpapers. Riko realizes she'll be late for school and makes her way. With Gojo on the phone to Master Michiyaga, he asks if it's safer if they should head straight for Jujutsu High. But he explains to let Riko to enjoy her last few days as herself before merging with Master Tengen. It's explained by Geto that Riko will lose her memories and instead become Master Tengen, meaning she'll forget her friends and her previous experiences as a human. With Geto placing several cursed spirits around the school as a safety protocol, he senses that two of his cursed spirits have been taken down and alerts Gojo that there are some unwanted visitors at the school. It's shown to us two bounty hunters on the way to take out Riko Amanai after Toji played it smart and uses $250,000 deposit from the TVA and put a bounty on Riko. With the means to weaken Gojo and once it's said and done Toji would step in and put in the finishing blow. So Toji somewhat understands the strength of Gojo. That's why he's putting him through so much. Toji explains to Shiyu that Gojo acquires the six eyes and limitless curse techniques, so as long as Gojo's with her, they wouldn't be able to take out the star plasma vessel. During all this, Gojo and Geto make their way to these two intruders at the school. Geto is the first one to fight, coming up against a very old man, but his movements don't make it seem that way, dodging Geto's first attack, but ultimately Geto defeats him, simply using hand-to-hand -hand combat and some distractions. Meanwhile, Gojo runs in for Riko and retrieves her with all of her classmates stunned. But anyways, Gojo carries her like a suitcase and attempts to bring her to safety. This is when we see the other intruder, a bounty hunter wearing a bag over his head. We see him being confronted by Riko's maid, Kuroi, attacking this masked bounty hunter with her broom and subduing him, with Geto just arriving behind her and admires her strength. But this is when the masked bounty hunter melts to the ground and it is a Shikigami all this time, Geto alerting Gojo that the real masked bounty hunter might be next to him. Whilst on top of some buildings and carrying Riko at the same time, Gojo is confronted by five masked clones and they are not Shikigami, with each of them being the real one. Gojo being attacked reveals his infinity and is literally untouchable. He then explains his limitless techniques and how he can create impossible scenarios due to him being able to basically manipulate the time and space around him. He tries to use his red glow but instead improvises and punches him directly in the face as he hasn't really mastered the red glow technique yet. After defeating the masked bounty hunter, Riko receives a text message showing Kuroi tired and kidnapped since Geto left off further than her and she was swept from beneath their feet. Riko wants to join in on the rescue mission alongside Gojo and Geto but Gojo gives her a very intimidating and stark warning stating don't even try backing out halfway, we don't care if you're scared, got it? Well with that said Kuroi is rescued and we're shown as to what happened in the span of those days. And just a little side note, I know this is a timeline video but it was best if I explained this arc rather than diving too deep on the times but here is what happened after Riko, Gojo and Geto went to find Kuroi. Day 1, it was at 1.30pm when Kuroi was kidnapped. At 9pm later that day the kidnappers demanded to meet at Okinawa as a meeting spot. Day 2 at 9am, Riko, Gojo and Geto land at Okinawa. At 11am, Kuroi is rescued by Gojo and Geto with the kidnappers apprehended. An hour later at 12pm, the interrogation of the kidnappers is complete. Currently it's 1pm with Riko, Kuroi, Gojo and Geto enjoying their time at the beach. But this was a to-do list and expected to complete the escort mission by the third day. Anyways, with the four of them at the beach, Kuroi reveals she was just kidnapped by some normal people and not cursed users, saying how embarrassed she was. Kuroi asked why they wanted the meeting place to be at Okinawa and was worried that the people targeting them would destroy the airport. That is when we get to see two first years appear protecting the airport and that is Yuhai Bara and Kento Nanami, both first years at the time. Well anywho, Gojo and Riko are having the time of their lives at the beach with Geto and Kuroi watching over them. Geto is concerned about Gojo since he's literally had no sleep for the past three days, having to use his six eyes constantly to protect Riko, but reassures Geto saying that he has him to help him out. Anywho, the four enjoy their time at Okinawa and finally on the third day they finally reach Jujutsu High on the foothills of Mount Mushiro. 
The current time is 3 p.m. and it's been four hours since Riko's bounty was uplifted. The four appear at the back entrance of Jujutsu High, safe and sound within the Jujutsu barrier. Gojo, looking completely tired and drained, prepares to part ways with Riko Amanai for the last time, but in steps Toji Fushiguro, piercing Gojo with his blade, with the pair exchanging a few words and smirking. Gojo and Geto immediately get into battle mode, with Geto's cursed spirit swallowing Toji whole. Although Gojo was pierced, Toji wasn't able to hit any of his vital organs, and with Gojo smiling and reassuring Geto that he is fine. Gojo tells Geto to escort Riko into the Star Corridor, whilst Gojo fends off against the Sorcerer Killer. From within the mouth of Geto's cursed spirit, Toji with a villainous smile shredded through it with ease. Gojo realizing that Toji has a different sword than the one he got stabbed with. Toji sort of disappointed in himself, hoping that he would be successful in killing Gojo with that first initial strike, telling himself that he's become rusty, meaning that it's been a while since the Sorcerer Killer was let loose. As their confrontation goes on, Gojo in an instance uses his limitless curse technique, Blue, sucking in Toji from behind, but he instantly moves away from it. To Gojo's surprise, he doesn't notice any cursed energy from Toji, and that his power is all physical, and he has no cursed technique or energy. Toji strikes and instantly disappears again, with Gojo clocking on that Toji understands Gojo's cursed technique, and to keep out of sight, as Gojo relies on seeing cursed energy of his opponents with his six eyes. But this is a much different challenge against someone who has none. This fight becomes a game of hide and seek, Gojo just simply destroys his surroundings to find Toji, but that's where Toji set off a bunch of flyheads his way, another great distraction to stay hidden from Gojo's line of sight. Toji was hiding these flyheads in that cursed spear he has on his shoulder. He then appears right behind Gojo, quickly pulling out the inverted spear of heaven, a weapon which put one's cursed technique at a complete halt when pierced with it. Toji stabs Gojo right through the neck with it, but Toji doesn't just stop there, but absolutely stabs the hell out of Gojo and finishes him off by piercing his forehead, which is extremely brutal against a mere teenager. Just another reason why Toji was one of the most ruthless characters out there. With Gojo supposedly dead, Geto and Riko say their farewells at the Tomb of the Star Corridor, which is basically the bottom of Jujutsu High, but Geto has a change of heart and offers for Riko to go home with Kuroi, recalling a conversation he had with Gojo, saying how they should just call off the mission and let Riko go freely. With Geto telling him they might need to fight Master Tengen someday, Gojo responding that it's fine and because him and Geto are the strongest. A very strong line indeed. Riko mentions her backstory and how her parents died in a car crash which she doesn't remember, then pulling out her hand wanting to live, but in a blink of an eye she is shot right through the head in front of Geto. On the side of Geto's eye he witnesses Toji with a gun and telling him that he had killed Satoru Gojo. Geto in complete rage summons his rainbow dragon and faces off against Toji. The sorcerer killer explains that navigating his way through the tombs of the Star Corridor was pretty simple and because he has no cursed energy the barriers don't detect him as a threat, but when he uses one of his cursed tools it does put him in some visibility, so the cursed spirit he carries with him can shrink and he ingests it, which is camouflaged into his body. He casually pulls that out from his mouth and pulls out his cursed tool. The pair then go head to head, as Geto pulls out one of his vengeful cursed spirits, where she trapped Toji in his innate domain, where it can't be broken out of unless he answers his question. The question this vengeful spirit asks is if she's pretty to Toji, but regardless even with his life on the line, he just says you're not my type, to which several massive scissors appeared around Toji and this vengeful spirit was able to cut the ear off Toji slightly. He effortlessly destroys the scissors and knocks out Geta with ease who came from behind. He proceeds to step on his head saying that he would have killed him if he were a Shikigami user, but if he killed Geto, all the curses that he stored would run havoc and cause too many problems for him. He also tells him how he lost to a mere monkey that doesn't even use Jujutsu, which will play a big part later in the story. With Geto knocked out Cole, and Gojo supposedly dead, Toji gives the dead body of Riko Amanai to one of the members of the Time Vessel Association, as he's called Shigeru Sonoda. He says how he will give Toji a bonus for the mission he set him on, also talking about Master Tengen, saying that they would never have accepted Riko Amanai as the merger, even to the point where they are willing for Master Tengen to go berserk. That's when Toji and Shu make their leave, they both go their own ways. As Toji leaves, he comes across a dead man. This dead man was simply staring at him with a smile on his face, and that is Satoru Gojo. Toji in shock and Gojo explaining that he managed to survive due to using the reverse curse technique. He put this into motion when he got stabbed in the neck, showing us how much of a prodigy Gojo is. Even on the brink of death, he devised a plan to ultimately keep his life force alive. By multiplying the cursed energy together, it creates positive energy, which leads to reverse 
Toji's curse technique. Pretty simple, right? But Toji says that it's much easier said than done. Toji then proceeds to attack, but Gojo is in the zone, dodging every single attack of Toji's, which he couldn't before. In midair, he combines a reverse curse technique with his limitless red, pulling off an attack which threw Toji miles away. Toji battered and bruised, realizing that Gojo is a monster. Toji tries breaking down the attack just now and reassuring himself of his victory, but he can't help but feel uneasy. Gojo still in midair has a moment of contemplation, understanding that he isn't angry for Riko, and nor is he angry himself, but instead just feels surreal. He says the famous lines, throughout heaven and earth, I alone am the honored one. Toji doing his utmost best to attack Gojo is instead hit with a technique only a few know within the Gojo clan for generations. Using his purple and Toji realizing that he is facing off against the greatest sorcerer alive. The attack hits and Toji has half of his body severed. Remembering his wife and Megumi, using his last words to tell Gojo that he has a kid who will be sold to the Zenin family in a few years time, telling Gojo to do whatever he wants with him. Gojo retrieves the body of Riko, with the members of the TVA around him and Ghetto, applauding the fact that they killed off a middle school girl. Gojo broken inside asks Ghetto if they should kill them all, but the pair realise that it would just be pointless. A year after the incident with the Star Plasma Vessel, takes us to August of 2007 in chapter 76 of the manga. We see we see Ghetto and Shoko throwing a pen and rubber towards Gojo, to which it repels and doesn't touch him at all. Meaning during that year's time, Gojo was focused on perfecting his infinity to the point where he doesn't need to manually put it into effect anymore, but works automatically for him. So he's invincible without even trying at this moment in time. So at the age of 17, he can basically use the limitless technique for an unlimited time without using much cursed energy and keeping him protected at all times. This is something which was difficult for him when he was escorting Riko Amanai. Shoko says that he would fry his brain if he did so, but he explains that his reverse curse technique will be running around the clock meaning Gojo will have a fresh brain at all times. In simpler terms, he's becoming a god at this point. He mentions how he still needs to work on his domain expansion and other little things. That's until Ghetto realized Gojo has become the strongest. Gojo asks Ghetto if he's okay and it's revealed how Gojo now takes missions by himself as well as Ghetto. These two were slowly going their own route. He also says that much more curses began appearing during that year. This put a toll on Ghetto, calling it an endless cycle of exorcism and consumption. Since Ghetto has to eat the curse in order to store it within him and use it at his own will. This led him to say, it's a taste that nobody knows, the taste of a curse, like ingesting a rag used to wipe up vomit. This is where we begin to see a twist in the tale of an ever so righteous Suguru Ghetto, having a shower and contemplating why he must continuously put himself through torture just to protect those who couldn't care less about him. He even calls them monkeys. This was a little note he had taken from Toji, who called himself a monkey. The scenery then switches with Ghetto sitting alone with his head down at Jujutsu High. He is then approached by the first year student Yuhai Bara, as Haibara talks to Ghetto with so much excitement. A depressed Ghetto then asks Haibara if he wants to continue being a shaman, to which he responds that he gladly will. That is when we are introduced to a very new character and the other special grade shaman known as Yuki Sukumo, asking Geto what his type is. She then introduces herself as the one who messes around and takes constant trips overseas, but this encounter with Yuki Sukumo would eventually change the life of Geto. She mentions how her true motives don't align with Jujutsu Hai and how the organization only tends to the symptoms, but she wants to solve the root of the cause. She explains how she doesn't want to carry on taking down cursed spirits, but instead create a world where cursed spirits aren't born. She goes on to say how cursed spirits are obviously born from the excess cursed energy that humans give out. So she offers Ghetto two specific solutions to solve that. The first one being for humanity to lose all his cursed energy, thus there will be no cursed spirits to exist. And the second one is to make all of humanity to be able to control their cursed energy. Yuki gives her opinion and says how the first option for humans to lose all the cursed energy would be the best case scenario. She even rambles on about how Toji would be the best example for this. However, due to Toji's death, she can't really investigate the phenomenon of a heavenly restriction, and that there were just a few more underdeveloped people who had this heavenly restriction, but she'd need to wait a few years to break it down and see if it could be effective in wiping out all cursed energy throughout the world. Anyway, she says that for now she's chasing options too, and that is for humans to learn how to control their cursed energy. She states how shamans don't really leak any cursed energy out, and there hasn't been any cases of shamans creating cursed spirits unless they leave behind vengeful spirits. So by that theory, if everyone were to be shamans then no curses would exist. This put Ghetto in a state of shock, remembering those who celebrated the death of Riko Amanai. He surprisingly tells Yuki that we should just kill all non-shamans, to which Yuki doesn't even argue against and says how it's actually a good plan. 
Yuki gives a theory as to how to force humans to control their cursed energy and that is through natural selection, giving off a sense of fear and danger, would want everyone else to control this cursed energy of theirs so that normal calamities can occur. Geto confines into Yuki, telling her how his vision has become blurry, wondering whether he should protect the weak or force them to become shamans through fear, as this would end the existence of cursed spirits. But Yuki tells him that he isn't at that stage yet, and whatever path he chooses to ultimately follow will define who he really is. Could he be to protect the weak, or to solve the root of the problem by becoming evil? Yuki then leaves on her motorcycle and says that they should get along from now on, even mentioning how she came at the wrong time since she wanted to meet Gojo as well. Anyway, shortly after, we notice a first year Kento Nanami at the morgue with a dead Haibara as Geto looks on. Nanami then pleads that they should just let Gojo deal with everything, to which it leads Geto to a much darker turn, stating, This marathon called shamanism, what if beyond that there's nothing but a pile of shaman's corpses? This then brings us to the meeting between a young Aoi Todo and Yuki Tsukumo, which also took place in 2007, as it was revealed in chapter 50. An 8 year old Aoi Todo could be seen sitting on top of a beaten up high schooler. That's when Yuki Tsukumo arrives and asks Todo what his type is, then realizing that Yuki would be the cure to his boredom. I mean, from the way Aoi Todo acts, you can tell that he was mentored by Yuki. I would say that this meeting happened right after Yuki left Ghetto and suddenly bumped into this kid, but just how Ghetto's life changed when meeting Yuki, so did Aoi Todo's. Two years later in 2009, a year where a lot of stuff happened, one of them being Nobara's backstory. Nobara, who was presumed presumably 7 or 8 years old at the time, her backstory was explained in chapter 125 of the manga, as it begins with her explaining how she had moved to a rural village at the beginning of elementary school. Nobara mentions that the village she was living in didn't have many people. This was evident when she said, 19 students in the entire school, not even enough for one class at a regular school. This was when she met her new friend Fumi, asking to trade backpacks with her. This backstory was narrated by Fumi as she says how Nobara would always head to her house after school and play Smash Bros with her dad. Fumi explains how Nobara didn't really like people in her village, but there's one little mystery Fumi mentions, and that was how an old woman gifted Fumi red bean rice to celebrate her womanhood. It was at that point Fumi understood why Nobara felt so uncomfortable in the village. I mean that seems a little off for those out there, you should probably take a deeper look into it. Anyways, Nobara had told Fumi that she found a secret base and how Nobara would sometimes say the most mature stuff and out of nowhere switch it up by saying something stupid. Fumi mentions how someone influenced the way she spoke and she believed it to be her mom. When the two girls reached the secret base, it turned out to be a massive house and there was a girl called Sayori who lived there. Fumi says that she was always at home and even during their unexpected visits, she would welcome them in. Fumi noticed how much Nobara changed from being quite brash to becoming much softer and refined. However, that was when things at Sayori's house began to change, as her once beautiful home was vandalized with graffiti and became a shadow of what it used to be. Fumi says how herself and Nobara didn't remember much of what happened that day that Sayori left, but all she could remember was Nobara's messy crying face. As Fumi was surprised at how she found it difficult to remember what happened on the day that Sayori had left, and that is all there is currently on Nobara's backstory. In September of 2009, things would take a much darker turn for the entire Jujutsu world. Chapter 77 would continue the ever-changing mindset of Suguru Geto as he takes on a mission to exercise a cursed spirit, said to have been the cause of mysterious disappearances and deaths. However, with a man and woman escorting him to the village to show him what could be the problem of all this, two little girls around the age of 8 years old, caged and seen to have bruises all over them. The man and woman try to justify their actions to a shocked and angered Geto, stating how those two girls were the reason for all the damage done in the village. One of the girls tries to argue back but the woman shouts at them and says that their parents were exactly the same and that they should have killed them when they were babies. Suguru Geto in complete silence then puts his finger close to them, using a cursed spirit to tell them that everything will be just fine. This is where Suguru Geto embodies the second solution Yuki gave him and that was to instill fear into the non-shamans and have them control their cursed energy forcefully through the means of natural selection. He asks for the man and woman who accuse the young girls of such crimes to step out. This is when Suguru Geto kills all 112 inhabitants of the village using his cursed spirit manipulation and understanding that he must follow this path in order to eradicate all cursed spirits. He saves these two young girls and their names are Nanako and Mimiko. Five days after the massacre, forensics reveal that it wasn't the doing of a cursed spirit but instead caused by Suguru Geto's cursed spirit manipulation. 
declaring under the ninth article of Jujutsu regulations, he must be executed on the spot. Back at Jujutsu High, Gojo gets word from Masamichi Yaga about what Geto had done, with the pair in a state of panic and shock, with Masamichi Yaga needing to repeat himself just for Gojo to process all of this. We then get to see Shoko meet with Geto, but just a normal interaction between them. We even witness when Shoko begins smoking as Geto lights up her cigarette. I guess you could say that this is a symbolic scene, maybe because the beginning of a nicotine addiction began once the news broke out about Geto going rogue, but who knows. We can tell that Shoko is in despair but uses a joking manner to comprehend that one of her closest friends has now made an enemy of himself to the world. Geto tells Shoko how he plans on turning everyone into shamans through natural selection, also telling her that he's not a child and doesn't need everyone to understand him. To which she responds that it all seems childish to her, as she even calls Gojo on the phone to tell him where Geto is. Through the crowd of people in Shinjuku, Gojo and Geto finally meet, with Gojo's six eyes looking straight through him. Gojo tells Geto to explain himself, realizing that Geto is dead set on killing all non-shamans, even his own parents. The tables have turned immensely since 2006, Geto once being the righteous one and Gojo who was the rebel, but three years later it would be the opposite. Gojo tries his best to get Geto to change his mind, but nothing can save Geto at this point, as he's already chosen his own path. Gojo prepares to kill Geto on the spot, but Geto just walks away and Gojo can't bring himself to kill his best friend. We then see Geto talking to a very familiar face and that is Shiyu Kong, a former member of the Time Vessel Association, but Shiyu explaining how there is now a new organization. Geto is content with it and just wants to gather new curses and money, just like Toji in a sense. We then see a young Nanako and Mimiko being patted on the head and looking very happy rather than the time they were stuck in a cage. Suguru Geto then meets with all the top richest customers, managers and directors willing to fund this new organization. They seem displeased when meeting Geto at first. He then kindly asks an order to come up on stage, then brutally killing him with his curse spirit manipulation, wiping the blood off his face, menacingly saying, you will obey me you monkeys. He also debuted his new look where the famous Buddhist robes and is now the leader of an upcoming powerhouse organization at the mere age of 19 years old. That same year of 2009, this is when Gojo goes to meet a kid Megami, but obviously Gojo looks pretty annoyed since Megami resembles his dad, Toji. Gojo explains to an 8 year old Megami how his father was from the reputable Zenin clan and that he was planning on selling Megami to them. Gojo understands that Megami can see cursed spirits and all sorts and how he was his father's trump card. Megami couldn't care less about his dad saying even Sumiki's mom had left them and that they don't care about them anymore. Gojo offers Megami to come with him to Jujutsu High and how he'd get free accommodation there instead of being sold to the Zenin clan. He and Sumiki will be happier than being at a strict clan. He even tells Megami that he better get stronger and not to get left behind. So what's just happened is a 19 year old Gojo had just adopted an 8 year old boy and 9 year old girl, giving one of his greatest enemies children a safe place to stay rather than at the Zenin clan. Approximately a year later in 2010, a 10 year old Yuta Akatsu had made a promise to his very close friend Rika Orimoto, how they would one day get married with Rika giving Yuta an engagement ring. These two were pretty close, but unfortunately right before him a drunk driver drives right through Rika and kills her to which Yuta consciously cursed her and leading her to be attached to him. This car accident Yuta witnessed with his own eyes and was terrified by the new look of Rika who grabbed onto his legs from the ground. Five years later in 2015 chapter 42 of the manga is when Maki Zenin finally took the stand and had left the Zenin clan, confronting the head of the clan Naobito Zenin, saying that she intends on returning as the new leader of the Zenin clan, but Naobito laughs in her face. As she leaves, Mai is upset that her twin sister is parting with ways and leaving her all alone. This is the moment that Maki joins Jujutsu High based in Tokyo and lives there from now on. A year later a big event happens which would contribute to the ever changing tides of the Jujutsu world. In November 2016, persistent bullying of a 16 year old would lead the bullies to become deformed and stuck inside of a locker, where they were all severely injured. Panda, Maki and Inumaki discuss about how there's going to be a new transfer student, to which Maki just says that if he mouths off, then they'd just teach him a lesson. We then notice the famous execution room with Satoru Gojo, who is donning bandages to cover his eyes, rather than his blindfold which we see later on. He talks to this 16 year old boy who is frightened, and that is Yuta Akatsu, picking up a knife from the room which was all twisted. Gojo asked him what he tried to do and that he attempted to kill himself, but it seems as though something prevented it from happening. Yuta explains his life after the age of 
of 10 and how Rika would get in the way of a lot of things, thus why he isolated himself from the world, even growing distant from his own family. Gojo tells him that he can utilize his unforeseen ability into a force that protects, and that is when the first year students are introduced to the very new transfer student, Yuta Akatsu. As Yuta walked in with a curse looking around his shoulder and a menacing aura, however as Yuta introduces himself, he doesn't get a warm welcome, but instead the three of them pounce at him and Maki using her red spear curse tool to threaten him. Since they all realise that Yuta's been cursed, from within the blackboard two massive hands appear and grab Maki's curse tool with ease telling the three not to bully Yuta. After this little altercation, Gojo then reintroduces Yuta and tells them all to get along as Maki, Panda and Inumaki are simply battered and bruised. Gojo explains the abilities of his classmates and sets them all on a task to pair up with one another. Maki and Yuta are paired up but Maki's nature made it look a bit scary to him. The first mission that Maki and Yuta are assigned to is to find two missing elementary school kids at the school where there have been sightings of some cursed spirits. Gojo lets down the curtain and has the pair take on the curses with Maki pulling out her red spear curse tool and taking on the oncoming curses with Yuta terrified and hiding behind her. They then head into the school, Yuta asking questions upon questions and we can see how scared he is. With Maki and Yuta distracted by talking, a massive curse appears from the hallway and manages to swallow them both. Inside the mouth of this cursed spirit, Maki scolds Yuta for letting her guard down but they find the two missing children, one kid knocked out and the other with his eye turned black. This is where Maki realises she took a fatal hit during the swallow and ends up unconscious, which eventually left Yuta all alone to deal with the situation. Yuta concerned understands what he must do, he pulls out the engagement ring which was given to him when he was 10 and awakens Rika to help him out. Rika goes on a complete rampage and takes out the curses in the area, as Yuta can be seen carrying the two kids and Maki on his back to safety, right before Gojo who was waiting for him at the car. At the hospital, Gojo explains to Yuta that he was the one who cursed Rika and not the other way around. He then vows to become stronger. Gojo has a meeting with the higher ups as they complain that the cursed Rika, if she weren't subdued then she would have gone on to destroy a town in minutes. They also warn him that Yuta's execution is still on hold. Gojo responds that when it comes down to it he'll side with Yuta. Coming out of the meeting, he visits Yuta who has been training hard. He then takes him and gives him a katana which will be used to store the power of Rika inside. But not power that would become overwhelming, however would help him control Rika over time. Maki goes on to constantly train Yuta in the art of swordsmanship and to own his skills. After this, Yuta and Inamaki are assigned on a mission to get rid of some grade 2 curses at a shopping centre. This is where he gets closer to Inomaki. Inomaki displays his curse technique which is curse words to Yuta and gets rid of a swarm of curses. However, they both come up against a much stronger curse spirit. Inomaki suffering and unable to speak or use his curse technique, it's all down to Yuta again to prevail. He displays his swordsmanship and is able to do some damage, but at the end Yuta and Inomaki with a bit of neat combo work, they manage to defeat this curse spirit. But little do they know, Suguru Geto was watching from above and it was his curse spirit which he let loose in order to witness the ability of the famous Rika. Geto grabs a hold on Yuta's ID and says that as a fellow special grade shaman, he should greet him soon. We then get to see what the life of Suguru Geto's has become. Being the leader of his own cult, he is seen as a deity who takes on odd jobs to protect non-shamans or so it seems. He helps one girl but once she leaves, he proceeds to call them monkeys. Geto's entire personality has changed at this point when compared to him during his high school years, being much more sadistic. Geto then heads to his office where his fellow curse users reside and we notice a much older Nanako and Mimiko telling them that it's time to make a paradise filled with Jujutsu sorcerers. Geto's very first target is going to be Jujutsu High, the very cornerstone of the Jujutsu world. As Yuta, Maki, Panda and Inumaki are outside the school, in comes Suguru Geto, appearing before its former classmates for the first time in 7 years. Geto isn't alone though, he arrives with Nanako, Mimiko and another cursed user. But in a blink of an eye, Geto appears right in front of Yuta to introduce himself talking about Yuta's special ability, which is Rika and his ideology. Gojo steps in and asks what Geto wants. Geto is blunt, saying that he came to declare war. It will take place on the 24th of December and he will perform the Hyakiyako, which is the night parade of 100 demons. Geto plans on unleashing 1000 cursed spirits across Kyoto. He then leaves without any struggle, since Gojo was prevented from doing anything due to students being in the range of Geto's extremely powerful curses. All the high grade sorcerers have a meeting and Master Michiyaga declares that this is an all out war against against Suguru Geto. The day has come, the night parade of 100 demons, 24th of December 2017, as Geto's true plan is to kill Yuta and consume Rika, because Rika is his only hope in defeating Satoru Gojo. With the other 
sorcerers including Gojo stationed at Kyoto, Yuta and Maki are the only ones left behind, since Yuta is inexperienced and Maki has no chaos technique, which makes them vulnerable. Maki talks about her time at the Zenin clan and why she's seen as a failure, but Yuta sees right past that and wants to become like her, which she obviously blushes. But that is when a really powerful curtain is let down at Jujutsu High from Suguru Geto. Maki stands face to face with Geto and that is when Gojo is informed of what is going down in Tokyo. Gojo sends Panda and Inumaki to go help Yuta and Maki. When they arrive, they go all out against Geto and his cursed spirits, but are pummeled to the ground. This is when Yuta witnesses the carnage done to his friends, as Maki has a severed leg and is knocked out cold. Yuta goes berserk and awakens Rika. Surprisingly undercover, Yuta uses reverse curse technique to keep Maki alive. He even uses Inumaki's curse words, which surprises Geto. Yuta manages to push Geto into a corner, to which Geto unleashes Uzumaki, a technique which combines all his cursed spirits into one single attack. This is where Yuta manifests Rika to her full potential and a massive clash of attacks occurs. But there was only one winner, Yuta Akatsu. Geto seen in one of the alleyways with half of his body dismembered from the attack, he then meets Gojo, to which his life ultimately comes to an end from the hand of his best friend. Anyways, Yuta wakes up to see Panda, Inumaki and Maki all cured, with Maki's lost limbs being back in her body. This is where Rika shows her true form, and that is her as a child, as this means the curse Yuta placed on her is finally broken. Gojo even mentions the reason why Yuta can store such amounts of cursed energy, and that is because himself and Yuta share the same ancestor, and that is Michizane Sugawara, one of Japan's big three vengeful spirits. It all comes to an end when Gojo gives Yuta back his ID that Geto had, and so that is the end of Jujutsu Kaisen Zero. With every ending comes a new beginning. Six months later, in June of 2018, we are introduced to the main character of Jujutsu Kaisen, which is Yuji Itadori. As for what happens, many of us already know, a young first year student known as Megami Fushiguro was tasked with the job of locating a specific curse object. This curse object would be placed in the high school Yuji attended, but when both unknowingly cross paths with each other, something clicks between the pair, which baffles Megami. Anyways, Yuji was a part of the occult club at his school which consisted of Sasaki and Iguchi. The three would go on the hunt for cursed items, and they were all into their horror stories, but this hobby got them into some serious danger. At this point in time, Yuji would receive a call from the hospital, informing him that his grandfather, Wasuke Itadori, had just passed away. He was his only relative, and he cared for him deeply. Although Yuji did feel sad, he was constantly questioning his role in the world. That was until Megami had caught up with him, asking about this cursed object, which Yuji realized was in the hands of Sasaki and Iguchi. The pair immediately head to the school, with Yuji confused as to what is going on. As Megami enters, he notices Sasaki and Iguchi were at the hands of a cursed spirit. But that's when Yuji uses his abnormal strength to jump to the second floor and save Sasaki from the cursed spirit. Yuji and Megami then face off against a much bigger and stronger cursed spirit, but the cursed object which was in Yuji's hand was an old crooked finger. Megami explains that the cursed finger belonged to the king of all curses, Ryomen Sukuna, and how by consuming it Yuji would die instantly because there was only a 1 in a million chance of Sukuna being revived, but it seems Yuji was indeed the 1 in a million. As Sukuna had taken over his body, he eradicated the massive cursed spirit with ease. Megami bears witness to the king of all curses, as he just paralyzed in shock and fear. Sukuna taking in the moment and seeing what Earth has become since being sealed away 1000 years ago. Luckily, the strongest sorcerer of this generation conveniently arrives with souvenirs in hand. He nonchalantly challenges Ryoman Sukuna. Testing out Sukuna's physical abilities, he then sees enough and knocks him out with one blow, taking Yuji to the famous execution room which Yuta Okatsu was once inside of. Gojo then explains how Yuji's execution has been halted, and his plan was to feed the rest of the 19 remaining fingers to him and ultimately kill him. Yuji accepts this condition, but he must first confront the principal of Jujutsu High to allow him entry into the school. He visits Masamichi Yaga and takes on his cursed puppets. The principal just wanted to know if Yuji had enough conviction to be a student at the school and so that he can accomplish his mission. He's accepted and is also moved into the dorms of Jujutsu High right next to Megami. This then takes us to Yuji's very first mission as a Jujutsu sorcerer, meeting Nobara who'd be a part of the squad. Gojo takes them to Rapongi, tasking Yuji and Nobara with the mission to exercise the curses in the house. They both head inside with Nobara going one way and Yuji the other, but Nobara comes across a cursed spirit holding a child captive. The pair manage to defeat the cursed spirit and save the child. The four of them then head out to have some 
beef steak. A month later in July 2018, Yuji Megumi and Nobara would take on their first life endangering mission. The three were taken to a detention center to supposedly take out some minor curses, but that wasn't the case. As they entered, they realized they were inside of an innate domain, given off by one of the curses. The three of them dive deeper into the detention center, but that's when Nobara suddenly gets sucked into a portal into another location. However, this is when a special grade cursed spirit appears right before Megumi and Yuji, but Yuji immediately advises Megumi to save Nobara and that he'd be fine since he has Sukuna inside him. Megumi leaves as Yuji gets absolutely obliterated by this special grade. As Yuji accepts his fate, suddenly Roman Sukuna takes over. He even pulls off his domain expansion, kills the cursed spirit and consumes the cursed finger. Someone must have placed the cursed finger in the detention center for such a powerful cursed spirit to appear it seems. During all this, Megumi was able to save Nobara and have Ijuchi send her to the hospital. However, Ryoman Sukuna appears right behind him. Sukuna rips out Yuji's heart and threatens Megumi, to which the pair then go head to head. Megami using all the Shikigami in his locker was battered by Sukuna, but even up against the king of all curses, Megami gives off a smile to Sukuna, ready to pull out his hidden weapon, but Sukuna gains a liking and interest towards Megami. Just when we thought Megami would die to Sukuna, Yuji regains control, but dies in front of Megami due to him having his heart ripped out. This takes us to the next segment. Yuji's dead body was taken to Shoko to have an autopsy, to which Gojo immediately shows his hatred towards the higher ups understanding that they placed the cursed finger at the detention center to kill off Yuji, but what's really happening inside of Yuji's head is that he's trapped in Sukuna's innate domain, with Sukuna offering a binding vow to Yuji, since Sukuna can only exist if Yuji is alive. That is until Sukuna can find his original body of course. Yuji flat out declines his binding vow, but Sukuna says if Yuji can defeat him, then he wouldn't enforce one on him. In a single slice, Sukuna defeats Yuji, to which Yuji rises from the dead back into his body. Gojo and Shoko were completely stunned by this, but this then moves us on to Yuji being taught the basics of cursed energy and cursed technique. He is forced to watch movies in order to control his cursed energy. Gojo leaves Yuji to it. As he heads for Kyoto, he feels an ominous aura. Gojo is then attacked by Jogo, a special grade cursed spirit working under what is believed to be Suguru Ghetto. Gojo teleports Yuji to the battleground and has him witness his domain expansion. Jogo, who is on the brink of defeat, was saved by another special grade cursed spirit, who is called Hanami. In September 2018, Gojo decides to keep Yuji listed down as dead, in order to find out who made a hit on him, but he leaves Yuji in the care of Kento Nanami. This would then introduce us to Mahito, an incident occurred in which some bullies at the cinemas were disfigured brutally and also the introduction of Junpei, as Junpei could see Mahito with his very own eyes. Junpei and Mahito both grew close, but this would lead to something incredibly heinous. Yuji then crosses paths with Junpei to see if there was anything peculiar about him. In the meantime, Nanami would go up against Mahito, but Mahito escapes with his life intact. Yuji and Junpei grew close, with Yuji being invited by Junpei's mom to have dinner at their house. The following day, Junpei's mother would be found dead and severed in half, to which Mihito convinces Junpei that it was the doing of one of his bullies, but in actual fact it was a cursed finger which was placed at their house which would cause her death. Junpei, with the teachings from Mihito, utilizes cursed energy and even began summoning his own Shikigami. In a fit of rage, he goes head to head with Yuji, who just wants to help him out and find out what made Junpei turn all aggressive. This is when Mihito turns up to confess he was the one to have caused Junpei's mother's death. He then transfigures Junpei right before him, but it was so brutal it killed him off. Yuji, full of anger, faces off against Mahito. Through a hard fought battle, Mahito corners Yuji and attempts to transfigure him, but this is where Sukuna intervenes and hurts Mahito with ease. Mahito understood that Yuji was the only person capable of touching and killing him, and luckily Nanami arrived to help out. Mahito decides to release his domain expansion, trapping Nanami inside of it. Nanami knew that he was a dead man. Crazily enough, Yuji breaks through the domain expansion with his own physical strength, as this causes Mahito to shrink and retreat, showing a lot of interest in Yuji. Yuji then vows to kill Mahito. Back at the school with Maki, Nobara, Panda, Inumaki and Megumi being introduced to one another and training for the Kyoto Goodwill event, which would have both Kyoto and Tokyo schools against each other. Megumi faces off against Aoi Toro and Nobara against Mai Zenin, who is Maki's twin sister. After being beaten to a pulp by Aoi Toro, Megumi is rescued by Panda and end in Umaki, and Nobara is saved by Maki. They then part ways whilst Gojo is busy down in Kyoto confronting their principal known as Gaku Ganji. Later that month, the Kyoto Goodwill event would begin, as Gojo rolls in and surprises everyone with a supposedly dead Yuji who's alive again. I mean the reactions from this was classic. 
Yuji is then introduced to the second years as they plan out their strategy to defeat the Kyoto school. But the Kyoto school has different plans, with Gaku Ganji assigning them to kill Yuji during the event. Long story short, each student faces off against each other in a one on one. Yuji taking on Aoi Toto, Nobara facing up against Momo, Panda vs Mekomaru, Maki vs Kasumi Miwa, and Mai Zenin, and Megami vs Norotoshi Kamo. Those fights unravel, but Inumaki stumbles up against a special grade cursed spirit, and this is of course Hanami. During Megami's fight against Norotoshi Kamo, Inumaki arrives to warn them of the danger. The three try and hold back this special grade, but it's too much for them. Eventually, Maki and Megami team up to fight Hanami, but they were both hurt badly by Hanami's attack. Thankfully, Aoi, Toto, and Yuji arrive to team up against the special grade, where they show off some insane combo moves. Gojo, witnessing all this from above, goes to take out Juzo first, and then he appears again to use his famous purple technique, obliterating Hanami and saving Yuji and Toto. In actual fact, this deep Koi Hanami played was so that Mahito could enter the Jujutsu warehouse and retrieve the death painting rooms. These are cursed spirit and human hybrids which have been stored for centuries. These were essential for the so-called Suguru Ghetto to get his hands on. The event between the two schools were cancelled, but instead it was all decided on a baseball match, which the Tokyo school had won. Towards the end of September and beginning of October, Yuji, Megami and Nobara would go on a mission which would develop our main characters even further. This was the beginning of the death painting arc, as the three head to Megami's old middle school to uncover the many mysterious deaths and disappearances. This is where we get to understand more about Megami's sister Sister, Sumiki, who was cursed during their middle school days and has been in a coma ever since. Two students give them more information behind it, but Megami goes alone to figure out the cause of Sumiki's curse. It was said that the root of this was coming from under Yosuhachi Bridge, but to Megami's surprise, he's helped by Yuji and Nobara. Just like their first mission, Nobara was pulled out and put into another location, but this time Megami tells Yuji to go and help her while he takes on a special grade curse spirit by himself. Although Megami was struggling immensely, he realizes the words of Gojo and goes for a home run, awakening his incomplete domain expansion. But even though it was premature, he managed to defeat the special grade all by himself and retrieve another one of Sukuna's fingers, completely passing out straight after. During all this, Yuji and Nobara would face off against the death painting rooms known as Esso and Kachizu. Through a hard fought battle, Yuji and Nobara had no other choice but to physically kill the brothers. Back at their base, Choso feels that his brothers have been killed and can't help but feel angst. Yuji contemplates the idea of having killed someone, in which Nobara reassures him. They both stumble on a passed out Megami who suddenly wakes up, accidentally feeding Sukuna the finger. Days after they had completed another mission, but Yuji leaves to go to watch a movie that he wanted to see. Nobara then comes across Yuko, who was an old friend of Yuji's during middle school. Nobara texts Yuji to come by. But Yuko looks completely different than what she looked like during her middle school days. Yuji immediately notices that it's her, regardless of her new appearance and then bids farewell to her. This then brings us to October 2018, as Utahime and Gojo are on the phone to one another, discussing the traitor who had let in the likes of Mahito and Hanami into the school through the curtain. Utahime receives the help of Yuji, Megumi and Obara to find out who sold them out. Utahime's money was on Mekomaru. They then explore a hidden location going through each door, but couldn't find any sign of anyone. This is when we are switched to seeing Suguru Geto and Mahito entering an underground place, which held the true form of Mekomaru in, as he was plugged into various life support machines and all bandaged up. It's understood that Mekumaru's real name is Kokichi Muta, and he was indeed the one who betrayed the Jujutsu schools. This was a give and take offer though, Mahito offering to transfigure Kokichi's body back to normal if he had led them into the school during the Kyoto Goodwill event. Suguru Geto and Mahito both hold their side of the deal and transfigures Kokichi's body back to normal. This then causes the face off between Mahito and Mekumaru, with Geto watching on from the sidelines. The fight between them two is evenly matched as Kokichi reveals he has years worth of cursed energy stored to use against Mahito. Mekomaru understands his position in this fight and knows that he'd need Gojo to come out with his life intact, but it seems that the curtain which was placed by Geto is in the way of Kokichi's communication system. Mahito then uses his domain expansion to trap Kokichi inside of, but it's revealed the simple domain which I mentioned earlier in this video as this was created by Ashia Saratsuna during the Heian era. This technique was created in order to counter another domain expansion from within. This had even surprised the supposed Suguru Geto, who was just watching on. Kokichi does his calculations and realizes that once he's dealt with Mahito, he still has 9 years worth of cursed energy stored and another simple domain in his locker to fight against Geto. However, his plans are completely ruined. 
When Kokichi activated his simple domain, Mahito managed to undo his domain expansion just in time, then killing off Mekomaru. Geto and Mihito discuss what had just happened, and Geto realizes he must make adjustments to his screen before their big plan which would be set in Shibuya. 31st of October 2018 a curtain with a 400 meter radius was placed and that is when the Shibuya incident arc begins. The Shibuya incident arc takes place in chapter 83 and for me personally it is the best arc in Jujutsu Kaisen so far. We got to witness a wide range of fights all occurring minutes apart from each other or at the same time. As for this part of the video I'll be going over the times in order so that we can get a better understanding of how the events in Shibuya took place. At 7pm, Geto had placed down the newly developed curtain over Shibuya, where only the civilians could not get out. There is no reception from within the curtain, so using your mobile phones would be futile to talk to someone. At 8.14pm, three teams are formed and on standby waiting outside the curtain. The first team consisting of Kento Nanami, Takuma Ino and Megami Fushiguro. The second team which has Naobito Zenin, Maki Zenin and Obara Kugisaki. The third team has Atsuya Kusakabe and Panda. These teams are set there to minimise the damage. Well, at 8.31pm, there are civilians who were out during Halloween all dressed up, but it seems they can't leave due to the curtain, which causes a state of panic amongst them. One of the guys witnessed several people being sucked into the train as though it were a bathtub draining water. In the state of chaos, in steps Satoru Gojo, who effortlessly walks right through the curtain. 8.38pm, Gojo arrives at the Shibuya Mall, casually walking over everyone and then rising above to see how many people have been trapped as well as assessing the situation. A minute later at 8.39pm, we get to see the fourth squad which consists of Yuji, Meimei and her little brother Wiwi who were at Ayoama Cemetery at this moment in time. They then head towards the Meiji Jingu Mai Station. At 8.40pm on the Fukutoshin line platform, Gojo is then confronted by Jogo, Hanami and Choso, as Gojo tells Jogo to not pull out any excuses when he loses this time around as they all prepare to fight. Gojo notices that Hanami had used his branches to trap all the civilians, to which Gojo understands that if he attempts to run away, they would just kill all the civilians. However, Jogo has different plans and intends on killing the civilians anyways, as a bunch of them flood the train line where Gojo is standing, with Hanami, Jogo and Choso hiding within the crowd. Jogo, Hanami and Choso then go all out killing quite a few civilians ruthlessly. This is when Jogo and Hanami try to attack Gojo, to which they are blocked out by Gojo's infinity, but both Jogo and Hanami use domain amplification on Gojo, which is sort of similar to a simple domain but adds a watery substance over Gojo and would make him now vulnerable towards their attacks. It then shows us a flashback of Jogo's conversation with Suguru Geto, saying how anyone who comes in the way of Gojo would just be a hindrance and that he wouldn't use his domain expansion since it would crush the civilians against the curtain, with Gojo who seemed to have run away, but Gojo simply looks down and takes the piss out of him walking straight up to Gojo and simply ripping his arm off, then ripping Hanami's branches from his eyes. In a turn of events, feral Gojo kills Hanami by blasting him, he then says next. 8.51pm, this is when Yuji, Meimei and Uiwi arrive at Meiji Jingu Mai Station near Exit 2, as they are addressed that there are transfigured humans within the curtain, to which Yuji immediately understands that this is the doing of Mahito. Meimei sets out her crows to explore the station, she then gives Yuji the option whether he'd want to kill a bunch of mutated humans or simply exercise one cursed spirit. Meimei explains that all the civilians have gone down all the way down to the bottom floor of the station since they were being chased down by Mahito. Hito and the transfigured humans. Meimei and Uibi head a different way to rescue as many civilians as they can from the platform whereas Yuji heads to a different direction to take out a certain cursed spirit. 9.03pm, as Yuji ventures down he comes across a grasshopper cursed spirit eating the head off a civilian. Yuji asks the grasshopper where Mahito is. Yuji then spots one of the nails for the curtain which was placed by Mahito to cover one of the platforms and plans to destroy it so that Meimei and Weebi can make their way. Yuji then gets into a fight against the grasshopper. The grasshopper proclaims how smart he is but Yuji completely demolishes him in a full on fist fight. 9.14pm, Yuji defeats the grasshopper curse and was able to destroy the nail placed by Mahito for his little curtain, which now grants access for Meimei and Bibi to go and find the person in control of the actual curtain covering all of Shibuya. Whilst all this was going down, Jogo and Choso were going along with their hit and run tactics against Gojo, using as many civilians as they can to get in Gojo's way and try their best to keep him company. But at the same time, which is 9.14pm, Mahito conveniently arrives at Gojo's location with hundreds if not thousands of transfigured humans, to which even Gojo was confused on what their plan was. 
9.15pm, Mei Mei, Wee Wee and Yuji arrive at the Fukutoshin line and not too far from where Gojo is, but weren't near him at the time. They witnessed the train which was carrying the transfigured humans earlier, arriving and understood they were going to be unleashed against Gojo. A minute later at 9.16pm, the fight between Gojo, Mahito, Choso and Jogo commences, as Mahito tests out Gojo and is delighted by his infinity, but as more and more civilians fall to where Gojo is, he is distracted for a split second, and Mahito and Choso combine their attacks against him. Although they weren't able to land a hit on him, the humans around Gojo paid the price and were brutally killed. Gojo realising how bad the situation has become, takes a moment to think. The Cursed Spirit's goal was to force Gojo to use his domain expansion, which would have ultimately squashed all the civilians and killed them. That's what they thought would happen. Mahito in complete shock witnesses Gojo using his immeasurable void for 0.2 seconds. Due to the amount of information being poured out from this domain expansion, all the humans within 0.2 seconds gained half a year's worth of information and left them standing unconscious. But during those split seconds, Satoru Gojo was able to destroy 1000 transfigured humans which Mahito had let off, and it was truly a display that only the strongest sorcerer alive could do. But seconds later the supposed Suguru Ghetto drops the prison realm right before the feet of Satoru Gojo. Six minutes later at 9.22pm, the three teams who are on standby are now ordered to enter the curtain. Whilst advising them to enter the curtain, Ijuchi is attacked by Harita and stabbed right through the back. At 9.22pm, it was also the same time a massive change in balance would occur. Satoru Gojo witnesses the appearance of his former best friend, Suguru Ghetto. In that short span of time, years worth of memories jump back into his mind of Ghetto, being sure that he had killed Ghetto a year ago. Gojo is then apprehended by the prison realm. He shouts to Ghetto, saying how his six eyes tell him that this is indeed his best friend standing right before him, but his soul tells him otherwise. This is when we understand who is really behind Suguru Ghetto, unzipping his head we get to see a brain with a mouth. The brain begins to speak, telling Gojo that it is a cursed technique which allows him to hop between bodies and take control, also allowing them to use their victim's cursed technique as well. This brain talks about the incident prior about how Yuta Akatsu was the one who battered the body of Ghettos. With Gojo all stuck, this brain tells him that Yuta cannot become the next Satoru Gojo. He then says his farewell to Gojo, saying that he hopes to meet him again in the new world. Gojo talks not to the brain but to Suguru Ghetto, saying to him, how are you gonna let yourself get sealed like that Suguru? To our surprise Ghetto's hands grab his throat and the brain controlling him was surprised as well. The brain discusses with Mihito about his theory which was how the soul came before the body, but that little spasm the brain underwent, he understood how the soul is the body. Satoru Gojo is then successfully sealed within the prison realm, with the conditions being that the prison realm can only be opened again if the victim inside dies. Within the time between 9.22pm and 9.26pm, Yuji notices something jumping onto his ear, and that is Mekomaru's communication device. He announces to the three present that Satoru Gojo has been sealed within the prison realm. Mini Mekomaru explains the situation to Yuji, Meimei and Uiwi, talking about how he was already killed, and this was an advanced plan that he thought of if Satoru Gojo was to ever be sealed. Mini Mekomaru advises Yuji to make it to the ground of Shibuya and announce that Gojo has been sealed, because sealing Gojo would need everyone's help. This is when a few cursed spirits make their way to their location as they prepare to kill them off. At 9.26pm, Gojo realises that time doesn't pass inside of the prison realm and makes life difficult for the brain. By making the prison realm so heavy, it literally destroyed the ground. That is how dense Gojo managed to make it from the inside. We then see Gojo sitting back and relaxing on the bones of the people who were trapped in there and saying how he has faith in his students. Between the times of 9.27pm and 9.30pm, Mahito challenges the other cursed spirits on who can kill Yuji first. Mahito comes up with a compromise and says if Jogo meets Yuji first, he shall offer Sukuna more of his fingers, but if Mahito meets him first, he will kill Yuji. They then head off to find Yuji Itadori. From within the crowd, we see Nanako and Mimiko full of anger at the fact that Ghetto's body is being controlled by a brain, with the girls saying that they killed a bunch of civilians and they now want the brain to return Ghetto's body. But of course, this brain threatens Nanako and Mimiko, saying how they should run along if they don't want to die as well, to which the girls say that the brain will regret his decision. This brain simply doesn't care and sits next to the prison realm, which is currently processing Satoru Gojo. Also from the times between 9.27pm and 9.30pm, Yuji shouts for Nanami and announces that Satoru Gojo has been sealed inside of the prison realm. At 9.30pm, just before Mihito had left to find Yuji, he split himself into two. Between the times of 9.30pm and 
and 4 TPM, Yuji meets up with Team Nanami. Yuji explains the situation to the rest of the team, to which Mini Mekomaru says how they'll need to split up and multitask to get as much stuff done. Nanami tells Yuji, Megumi and Takuma Ino to deal with the curtain covering all of Shibuya whilst he makes his way to Ijuchi's location. Takuma Ino then explains the significance of Gojo being sealed and how the power of balance will tilt immediately. They then vow to rescue Satoru Gojo from the prison realm. From above the Shibuya tower we see three cursed users, an old man with a moustache named Awasaka, an old lady named Ogami and Ogami's grandson. Awasaka and Ogami discussing Satoru Gojo being sealed and how things are finally starting to get interesting. At 9.40pm, Nobara wanders through with Nita as they bump into Haruta as the pair both face off. Nita gets battered by Haruta and he also gets every hit on Nobara too. Haruta explains that his curse technique is his pure luck, basically meaning that he can get out of certain situations in a pinch. Four minutes later at 9.44pm, Nanami comes across a heavily injured Ijuchi. He then finds both Nobara and Haruta fighting. Nanami steps in and uses his ratio to beat the living crap out of Haruta. Haruta realises that if it weren't for his pure luck curse technique, then he would have surely died from that attack by Nanami. Just when Nanami is about to put the finishing blow to Haruta, he says he is sorry and Nanami simply walks away. Haruta is saved yet again by his curse technique. Nobara was watching on and witnessing the true strength of someone who is a grade 1 sorcerer. Between the times of 9.44pm and 10.01pm, Yuji attempts to punch the curtain, leaving Ino and Megami in shock. Ino understood that from physical strength alone, Yuji possesses more power than Nanami. However, the curtain didn't even budge. The three then try and understand where the person who placed the curtain in the first place could be, with them then realising they could be at Shibuya Tower. 10.01pm, Ino, Yuji and Megami fly towards the top of Shibuya Tower with Megami's new Shikigami. They use a wire to grab our sack eventually with Megami and Yuji landing at the bottom of Shibuya Tower onto the road and Takuma Ino left atop of the tower facing off against Ogami and her grandson. Takuma uses his curse technique which allows him to summon and use the abilities of four different spiritual beasts. He gets a hit on Ogami's grandson but Ogami advises him to swallow a pill. She then yells the name Toji Zenin and we actually witness her grandson turning into the deceased sorcerer killer. 10.02pm, back at the Meiji Jingumai station, Mei Mei defeats several cursed spirits and is now going up against a cursed user named Niji Ebina. However, this cursed user was begging for its life, but Mei Mei ruthlessly kills him, whilst her younger brother watches on. During all this, at 10.02pm, Yuji and Megumi combine their abilities, Megumi going all out with his Shikigami, and Yuji taking advantage to ultimately defeat Awasaka. The time between 10.04pm and 10.10pm on the top of Shibuya Tower, Takuma Ino is overpowered by the newly resurrected Toji Zenin and flung off of it, Megumi managing to save Ino and take him to get some aid, whilst Yuji leaves and heads towards Shibuya Station. Again, between the times of 10.04pm and 10.10pm, Mei Mei is confronted by the brain, as he leaves a disease cursed spirit for Mei Mei to fight, saying if she can defeat that, then she can come up against him next. Yet again between these times, Ogami's grandson loses control to Toji, who somehow takes over his body and can move at free will now, but the only condition is to kill anything in sight. Toji then kills Ogami, the user of the curse technique which brought Toji back to life in the first place. And from 10.04pm to 10.10pm again, whilst making his way to Shibuya Station, Yuji comes across Inumaki, who was using his megaphone to help out civilians and defeat curses with his curse words. At 10.10pm, 10, Yuji finally enters Shibuya Station. From the time between 10.10pm 10, and 10.20pm, 10, Yuji is confronted by Choso. Choso is immediately angered remembering that Yuji had killed his brothers, getting a direct hit on Yuji with his convergence. Their battle begins. At 10.20pm, Nanami meets up with Naobito and Maki, but they are then attacked by Dagon. But Naobito manages to attack back with ease, even ruffling a few feathers off of Dagon. To the point Dagon grows into his actual form. The fight commenced between Dagon, Nanami, Naobito and Maki, but they struggle to exercise Dagon. From 10.20pm to 10.51pm, just when Naobito thought he had killed Dagon, Dagon awakened his domain expansion, taking them to a beautiful seaside. Within Dagon's domain expansion, each attack he pulls off would be a guaranteed hit on his opponents. Dagon decides to use 70% of his power against Naobito and 30% on Nanami. Whilst all this fighting is going on, luckily for them, Megami enters by countering with his own domain expansion, Chimero Shadow Garden, leaving an opening so they can escape but he must maintain it. Nanami protects Megami so that he can focus on his domain. During all this, Naobito loses an arm. 
with them all getting ready to escape through the hole, in comes Toji Zenin, effortlessly grabbing the playful cloud from Maki, and going berserk against Dagon with such ease. Dagon is absolutely terrified by what he is coming up against. Toji defeats Dagon, and doesn't even have a single scratch on him. They then return to the station with the domain being destroyed. Whilst that fight was going on, between the times of 10.20pm and 10.51, Yuji was going head to head with Choso, but Yuji was totally overwhelmed by Choso's blood manipulation. With the help of Mini Mecha Maru, Yuji heads for the bathroom, letting off the water sprinklers, giving Choso a slight disadvantage since it'd be much harder to manipulate his blood within all the liquid. They both roll in a physical fight in the bathroom, but Yuji would eventually lose by a decisive blow from Choso. With Choso ready to give off the finishing blow, Sukuna looks on with annoyance. But something weird happens to Choso. A new memory was formed in his brain, showing him and his brothers and even Yuji sharing a meal. This left Choso in a state of shock, leaving Yuji with his life intact. Again between the times of 10.20pm and 10.51pm after the fight of Yuji and Choso, it seems Yuji's beaten body was recovered by Nanako and Mimiko, feeding Yuji several cursed fingers inside of the bathroom stall. At this moment of time, Toji had grabbed Megami and thrown him onto the road, as father and son prepare to fight. But as Toji pulls out his katana, Megami is filled with fear and summons Rabbit Escape, with thoughts only to evade Toji. From within the Shikigami, Toji easily slices right through to the pinpoint location where Megami is. Megami then cornered in an alley, and Toji's eyes go from black to normal, asking what Megami's name is. Megami tells him it's Fushiguro, to which Toji tells him good for you, and stabs himself in the head, meaning Toji overwrote the curse technique given off by Ogami, and was able to be alive again for those last few seconds, preventing himself from killing his son. Toji is then laid flat out dead right before Megami. And for the last time between the times of 10.20pm and 10.51, 1pm, Jogo appeared right behind a battered and bruised Naobito, Nanami, and Maki. Jogo goes on to burn Nanami, then moves on to burn Maki. Jogo then burns Naobito to death, however feels the presence of Sukuna and immediately leaves. At 10.51pm, Masamichi Yaga is guarding Shoko and the medical bay placed on the Shibuya line. Masamichi tells her how if the enemies were to find the location of the medical bay, they would kill Shoko instantly. The reason being because Shoko is the only one who can use reverse curse technique to heal others, which is something not even Gojo can do, as he can only use it on himself. Takuma Ino and Ijichi would have been dead, but Shoko had saved their lives. Between the times of 10.51pm and 11.01pm, some big changes happened happen to Yuji, as Jogo arrives at where Yuji is and notices Nanako and Mimiko feeding the fingers to him. The girls then escape so that they don't get killed by Jogo. That is when Jogo decides to take the leap of faith and feed Yuji 10 cursed fingers which means Yuji has consumed 15 out of 20 cursed fingers so far. Nanako and Mimiko then reappear as they manage to survive Jogo's attack. But right before us we witness Ryoman Sukuna awakening. Jogo jumps back as far as he can with Nanako, Mimiko and Jogo feeling the insane presence of Sukuna. Nanako and Mimiko bow all the way down, but Jogo only kneels, to which Sukuna slices off the top of his head. Sukuna offers to hear out Nanako and Mimiko, with the girls rethinking how they could never forgive Gojo for killing Ghetto. But the part in which they hate the most is Ghetto's body being taken over by the brain. Nanako then says to Sukuna that she'll give Sukuna another finger if she kills the cursed spirits and the brain. He then asks the girls to raise their head, and in the most ruthless fashion he beheads Mimiko. Nanako in complete shock tries to use a curse technique on Sukuna, but also has her head sliced into two, with Sukuna telling them how they had the nerve to order him around just for a single cursed finger. Sukuna then asks Jogo what he wants, he explains that their mission was just to simply revive Sukuna temporarily. Jogo understands that Sukuna couldn't make a binding vow with Yuji during the curse Wu mark, and he asks for Sukuna to make a binding vow with Yuji so he can take over his body permanently. Sukuna says that it isn't necessary and how he has his own plans. He then gives Jogo a deal. If Jogo can get one hit on him, he'll do as the other cursed spirits pleases, and that he would kill every single human in Shibuya except for one to which Jogo accepts. At 11.01pm, as Kusakabe and Panda venture forward, they come across two cursed users who are part of Geto's faction, the woman known as Manami Suda and the guy known as Toshi Hisanegi. Kusakabe prepares to attack them, but out of nowhere from one of the buildings, Sukuna is pummeling Jogo with a smile on his face. Sukuna is beating the living Dale outside of Jogo, not even giving him a chance to breathe. Kusukabe then advises the other two curse users to run away, but Sukuna appears right between himself and Panda in a blink of an eye. Sukuna tells them that if any human in the vicinity moves, he will kill them all, as Jogo's flaming meteor comes soaring down and crashes into where they are. But Sukuna was looking up at it and smiling. 
Anyways, during this battle between the times of 11.01pm and 11.05pm, Megami was holding on to a wound inflicted by Toji, saying that he must get to Shoko. However, this is when he is sliced by Haruta, leaving Megami with a life or death situation. At 11.05pm, with the odds stacked against him, Megami recalls a conversation he had with Gojo. Gojo was explaining the feud between the Gojo and Zenin clan, and how it began in the Edo period, when the heads of the clan had killed each other. The head of the Gojo family had the limitless and six eyes like Satoru Gojo, and the head of the Zenin clan had acquired the Ten Shadows technique exactly like Megami. Back to Megami's current situation, he says how he would never be able to become strong like Gojo, and realize how the head of the Zenin clan during the Edo period defeated the head of the Gojo clan. This specific moment would change things immensely. Megami Fushiguro awakens the eight-handled sword, Divergent Sealer, Divine General Mahoraga, a Shikigami so strong that it cannot be controlled. But the catch is, to summon this, Megami would be sacrificing his own life. Megami with a smile on his face, saying how he'll be the first one to pass on. A minute later at 11.06pm, Sukuna ultimately defeats Jogo and right before him, Uraume appears, with Sukuna being surprised they turned up. Sukuna then feels an immense presence which is Mahoraga and tells Uraume he has urgent business to attend to. He then tells Uraume to not neglect the preparations and that it won't be long until he is completely free. At 11.07pm, Megami down and out with Haruta begging Megami to wake up and stop Maharaga, Sukuna conveniently arrives and saves Haruta. Sukuna notices that Megami is in a state of suspended death, he uses his reverse curse technique to keep Megami alive, saying to him to not die, and that there's something he'll need him to do. Sukuna understands that he must defeat Maharaga, so that Megami doesn't die from the exorcism ritual placed on Maharaga. The battle between Roman Sukuna and Maharaga begins, with Sukuna using his dismantle mantle on Maharaga, he is then countered by the Shikigami. Sukuna then realises that Maharaga's ability is to adapt to literally any attack thrown at him and counter it. Sukuna has no choice but to use his domain expansion, Malevolent Trine. He activates his domain expansion by keeping Megami in mind, reducing the 200 meter hit radius to 140 meters so that he doesn't kill Megami in the process. Within this radius of Sukuna's domain expansion, it will kill everything and anything inside of it, killing all humans, curses and turning buildings to dust. Even after all that, Maharaga is seen to be crawling and regenerating, already adapting to Sukuna's domain expansion. But Sukuna uses his dismantle and cleave to put the finishing blow to the most powerful Shikigami of all time. Haruta tries to run away thinking that his lucky curse technique saved him from death yet again. However, his luck had run out with his body being sliced into two. The fight ends at 11.14pm with Yuji returning to his body and witnessing all the carnage which had taken place, seeing nothing but dust, debris and Haruta's dead body. Yuji then sees everything which Sukuna had done in his memories, falling to the floor and vomiting. Yuji crying begging for himself and Sukuna to die already, he realises he needs to keep moving forward. With no life left in his eyes, he heads towards Shibuya Station. From 11.14pm to 11.16pm, Nanami is also seen at Shibuya Station, his body half burnt but still killing as many cursed spirits as he can. With literally no life left in him, he kills even more curses, but that's when Mahito steps in and punches right through his body. Yuji arrives and witnesses Nanami being killed by Mahito. Nanami's last words to Yuji was, you've got it from here. This is when Yuji and Mahito finally face off against each other, a fateful encounter. At 11.16pm, Nobara meets Mihito's clone in an alleyway, as these two also face off with one another. Between the times of 11.16pm to 11.19pm, Yuji would fight against Mihito, dodging as many of Mihito's attacks as he can, getting punched by Mihito and then having a scar across his face. Mihito attempts to stab Yuji's heart, but right below him, Yuji gives off his manji kick, landing two blows to Mihito. Mihito says that it is now time for round 2 of their fight. Whilst Yuji was fighting Mihito, between the times of 11.16 pm to 11:19 pm Nobara was fighting against Mahito's clone Nobara gets hit on her shoulder but she counters by placing her hairpin into the forehead of Mahito and doing some damage to him Mahito's clone understands that the original Mahito fighting Yuji wouldn't be at its full potential unless they merge again forcing Mahito to run away to the location of its original soul at 11:19 pm Yuji notices how Mahito's original body was affected by Nobara's curse technique where she was fighting the clone taking advantage of this Yuji lands a few more more hits on him. 
Whilst this is all going down, between the times of 11.19pm and 11.25pm, Nobara chases after Mehito's clone. At 11.25pm, Mehito manages to reunite with his clone and touch the face of Nobara. Right before Yuji, Nobara's face explodes, leaving her most likely dead. Yuji is then beaten to a pulp by Mehito, as Mehito manages to use Black Flash on him. At 11.30pm, just when Mehito is about to kill Yuji, Aoi Toro arrives, saving Yuji and telling Mehito that they are the exception. Arata Nita, a first year auxiliary manager at Kyoto, tells Toto that he's finished treating Nobara, but she's most likely dead. Anyways, Toto shouts for Yuji to wake up and that their battle has just begun. Between the times of 11.30pm and 11.40pm, the decisive battle between Aoi Toto and Yuji Itadori versus Mahito begins, but Yuji tells Toto that he is basically a waste of space whilst crying away. Mahito couldn't care less and goes to attack Toto, however as this goes down, Toto manages to make some time to uplift Yuji again. Toto evading Mahito's attacks is then surprised when Yuji uses his black flash and punches Mahito right across the place. Yuji back in action, using their famous clap and switch combo against Mihito is revealed that Mihito, Toto and Yuji have brought out 120% of the potential out. With the pair going all out against Mihito, he splits his soul and also splits apart Toto and Yuji. Toto dealing with the remnants of Mihito's soul and Yuji going up against Mihito. With Yuji and Toto reuniting, Mihito pulls off something that only Gojo was capable of doing and that is awakening his domain expansion, known as self embodiment of perfection, for 0.2 seconds. Mihito then comes face to face with Sukuna yet again, warning Sukuna that Yuji would be dead before he even gets the chance to switch bodies with him. Mihito then returns and in a single punch, Toto loses one of his arms and then he attacks him with Black Flash. With Toto down and out, Yuji comes in for the rescue and then Yuji and Mihito exchange blows with one another. Mihito enters his final form which is called Instant Spirit Body of Distorted Killing. Although Yuji was fending off against Mihito's final form, he was most certainly putting up a good fight against him, but that is when Yuji becomes the first ever sorcerer to be able to use Black Flash at will. Toto witnessing this from above, Yuji overpowering Mihito with each Black Flash and causing so much damage to Mihito, to the point where Mihito has reverted to his original form and with fear in his eyes as Yuji towers over him. At 11.40pm, Mihito is crawling away with the little bits of light life left inside of him, as he fears Yuji who is walking right behind him, however this is when the brain arrives. As he sucks up Mihito into his cursed spirit manipulation orb, Yuji is then obliterated by the brain, leaving him all bloodied up. Between the times of 11.40pm and 11.50pm, the Kyoto students arrive to save Yuji just in time. The Kyoto students with a team attack on the brain, but are luckily saved from the brain's maximum Uzumaki technique by Kusakabe and Utahime. Choso also arrives at the scene, angered at the brain, for making him kill his his newfound brother Yuji. It is then revealed that the brain was also the Norotoshi Kamo from the past who had created the death painting wombs. Norotoshi Kamo of the past who was known to be the most evil sorcerer in history, but it was the doing of this brain controlling different bodies. Uraume also conveniently arrives to aid the brain. Choso convinced that Yuji is indeed his younger brother due to the memory he had seen, he then attacks the brain. Uraume uses an ice curse technique on everyone, but that wasn't enough to subdue them. Uraume then uses a much more terrifying ice technique technique to which everyone thought they were going to die. Luckily to their surprise Yuki Tsukumo saves them and asks Geto for his reply as to what kind of girls he is into. The two then discuss what this brain's plan is, the brain explaining how Japan would be the perfect example to turn everyone into sorcerers, simply because of the presence of Master Tengen. The brain claims that the only way to do so is to create such a chaos in the country that not even he can control. The brain then displays that he can affect Master Tengen's Jujutsu barrier, shocking Yuki. This is when the brain reveals that he had just awoken several of the sorcerers he had made binding vows to during the past 1000 years, through remotely using the idol transfiguration he absorbed from Mihito. Basically meaning the brain has just rebirthed the most powerful sorcerers of the past 1000 years into the new world. The brain then unleashes thousands of cursed spirits as a distraction, holding onto the prison realm, and telling Yuji that he expects a lot from him, announcing to Sukuna personally that the golden age of curses has returned as he escapes alongside Uraume. And that was every single fight and event which happened in order of time during the Shibuya incident arc. The Shibuya incident arc has now ended and the date is now November 1st 2018. As for this next arc, it is called Yuji's Execution Arc, with this arc spanning from November 1st all the way to November 8th. It is revealed during this arc that all of Shibuya had been plagued with curses, 
escorting as many civilians as they can to safety. The Japanese government discusses whether they should announce the presence of cursed spirits, but decide not to. At 1.25am on November 1st, a young girl eating food from a convenience store is asked by a scary figure just outside the door to hand him some water. The young girl approaches this figure, and just when this cursed spirit is about to eat her, Yuta Akatsu makes his official debut in the Jujutsu Kaisen series, absolutely demolishing the cursed spirit with his katana and then converting the young girl. The cursed spirit tries again to attack them, but Rika eradicates it into just blood splatter on the wall. Yuta then arrives at a meeting with the higher ups. They order Yuta to execute Yuji Itadori. An announcement is then made clear from the higher ups, the first one being Suguru Geto is alive and he must be executed on the spot. Second one which is if anyone tries to free Satoru Gojo from the prison realm, they will be seen as a criminal. Third notice is that Masamichi Yaga will undergo the death penalty for being responsible of Suguru Geto and Satoru Gojo. The fourth notice is that Yuji's execution has now been ordered to be carried out immediately. The fifth and final notice is that Yuta Akatsu is now Yuji's executioner. On the 1st of November 6.02am, the brain who is called Kenjaku who I'll explain later in chapter 160 saves Yuji's old classmate Sasaki from the Sendai colony covered in one massive curtain, thanking her for getting along with his son Yuji Tadori. This colony will eventually play a massive part towards the next arc of the series, which I'll explain shortly. We are then introduced to Naoya Zenin, the son of Naobito Zenin. Although his father is on death's doorstep, he's excited by the idea of becoming the next head of the Zenin clan. We see him meet up with two other members of the Zenin clan, who are his uncles, Ogi Zenin and Jinichi Zenin. Jinichi Zenin attempts to attack him, but Naoya in a flash dodges it and appears right behind him. And then a small old man with the will of Naobito's arrives, and then their meeting commences. He proclaims that Naoya Zenin is to become the 27th head of the Zenin clan. However, if Satoru Gojo has been killed or mentally incapacitated for any reason, all assets as well as the Zenin clan will be passed down to Megami Fushiguro, meaning Megami has now become the head of the Zenin clan. Naoya asks for the location of Megami as he plans on killing him and Yuji, then Naoya can take his rightful place as the head of the Zenin clan. We then notice Yuki Tsukumo looking at all the carnage in Shibuya. As she says, it's now time for her to meet Master Tengen. Anywho, we also see Yuji and Choso on some steps. Yuji Yuji is exhausted and contemplating all the things which went down in Shibuya. Yuji talks about his concerns to Choso and is worried about what Sukuna is plotting, which involves Megami. Yuji and Choso then head out, being caught by Naoya Zenin shortly after. They square up against Naoya, but feel an immense pressure pulling them down, and that is Yuta Akatsu. Yuta chases after Yuji, and after a while, Yuta was able to sort of kill him using his katana with the help of Rika. In the meantime, Choso had defeated Naoya, but in comes Yuta to save the day. Yuta then orders Naoya to inform the higher-ups that Yuji has been killed. Obviously, during this, Yuji has a dream of his parents, and notices that his mother had the same stitching as the brain, basically revealing that the brain is the parent of Yuji. Yuji wakes up and sees Yuta next to a fire, smiling at him and relieved that his reverse curse technique was able to bring him back to life after temporarily killing him. Whilst Yuta and Yuji are having a conversation, from within the shadows, Megami appears, asking for Yuji's help. Megami explains the brain plans on creating a game consisting of sorcerers, whether they be from the past or present, and how his sister Sumiki is involved in all of this, so he needs Yuji's help to rescue her. The Culling Games is then introduced, with the brain using several parts of Japan to create different colonies, which involves just sorcerers, creating a sorcerer deathmatch. The rules of the Culling Games are as follows. Number 1. After awakening a curse technique, the players are given 19 days to register their participation participation into one of the colonies. Number 2. Any player with a curse technique that doesn't participate within the 19 days will have their curse technique removed. This basically means the person will die, as curse technique removal will lead to their death. Number 3. Non-players who enter a colony will be noted down as a participant of the games. Number 4. Players gain points if they kill other players. Number 5. Killing a sorcerer will give you 5 points, and non-sorcerers are worth 1 point. Number 6. When a player reaches 100 points, they can add a rule of their own. Number 7. The rule a player adds when they hit 100 points mustn't get in the way of the game or disrupt it, since the game master wants a culling game to last quite long. Number 8. If a player's score remains the same for 19 days, they will have their curse technique removed, meaning they will die. After all this had been explained and during Yuji being recovered by Yuta, Masamichi Yaga was caught and ultimately executed by Gaku Ganji. November 8th, 2018. Satoru Gojo has now been sealed inside of the prison realm for 8 days. 
November 9th, 2018. This is the beginning of the Perfect Preparation arc, which spans from chapters 144 to 158. Megami takes Choso, Yuji, and Yuta back to Jujutsu High and explains that the plan is to meet Master Tengen, who may have more information behind this brain, and also a way to unseal Satoru Gojo from the prison realm. They arrive back at Jujutsu High and see that Maki is alive with a burnt face and shorter hair as well, as Yuki, who is casually sitting down watching TV. Yuta is shouting Maki's name and is worried about her condition. The six of them then leave to find Master Tengen in the star corridors. They even notice dry blood on their way there, which was the doing of Toji all those years back. As they walk through to the main shrine, the room is empty and white. That's until a presence behind them appears, and that is a weirdly looking Master Tengen. Master Tengen introduces himself, and then explains that the brain is known by the name of Kenjaku, who has been hopping from body to body for the past 1000 years. Yuji asks why Master Tengen looks like that, and he explains that he wasn't able to merge with the Star Plasma Vessel all those years back, which caused himself to sort of lose control and evolve. Master Tengen then requests for bodyguards, and Yuki and Choso accept to guard him. As Master Tengen goes on to reveal Kenjaku's true motives, Kenjaku's goal is to spread cursed energy throughout the world and turn everyone into sorcerers. His goals align with Suguru Geto's, but Kenjaku doesn't have the facilities for that at the moment. What he needs is the final piece to the puzzle, and that is Master Tengen. His ultimate goal is to merge all humankind with Master Tengen, as this would link everyone to each other and speed the process of every single person becoming a sorcerer who can utilize cursed energy. But the downfall of this would mean if one person loses control, then everyone else will and cause the end of the world. Master Tengen explains that since he didn't merge with a star plasma vessel, he himself has evolved. But he is now more of a cursed spirit rather than a human being, making Master Tengen vulnerable to Kenjaku's cursed spirit manipulation. Master Tengen also mentioned how Kenjaku was involved with Sukuna 1000 years ago, but that's all the information he has on him currently. Master Tengen also blames the involvement of Toji Zenin 11 years ago, which destroyed everyone's fated destinies. But in order for Kenjaku's plan for all humans to merge with Master Tengen, he must first create a ritual. That's where the Culling Games gets introduced, by creating various colonies and having all these different sorcerers to exert that much cursed energy on the surface, it will connect Japan to this other side, which Master Tengen mentioned. However, Kenjaku is not the game master of the Culling Games, so killing him wouldn't get in the way of this ritual. Then Master Tengen and explains that they could unseal Satoru Gojo by pulling out the back of the prison realm, which he got his hands on prior. But the only way to free him would be using the inverted Spear of Heaven, which was destroyed by Gojo, and Miguel's Black Ropes, which was also destroyed by Gojo as well. Master Tengen does say that there is another way, and that is through a reincarnated sorcerer by the name of Hana Kurusu, who is now a part of the Culling Games. Her cursed technique can eradicate one's cursed technique, and that is the key to freeing Satoru Gojo. Currently, there are 10 colonies spread across Japan, Choso and Yuki will guard Master Tengen, Maki will head back to the Zenin clan warehouse to retrieve some cursed tools, Yuta will enter one of the colonies to get a head start and better understanding of the culling games, whilst Yuji and Megami go to find the famous third year Hakari. 9th of November 2018, Satoru Gojo has now been sealed inside of the prison realm for 9 days. This next phase takes place between the 10th of November to the 11th, with Megami and Yuji on the hunt to find third year Hakari. We are also introduced to the first culling game player, known as Fumihiko Takaba, a failing comedian. Yuji and Megami manage to reach Hakari's base successfully, to which Hakari hosts a fight club where people put down bets. Yuji agrees to join in on the fun, but realizing his opponent is Panda. The two understand that all they need to do is put on a thrilling show for the spectators, whilst Megami goes to find Hakari. It's during this time that Maki gets access to Juzo's workshop and retrieves the Dragon Bone Curse weapon. On the 11th of November, Yuji finally gets to meet Hakari. Hakari offers to hire Yuji as one of his fighters at his fight club. With Hakari interrogating Yuji, he sees through Yuji's bluff, and they both get into an altercation. Whilst Yuji is taking on Hakari in a fist fight, Megami Megami and Panda were facing off against Kirara, to which Megami successfully defeats. Yuji and Hikari carry on their fight, that's until Hikari admires Yuji's adversity and offers them a deal. Yuji, Megami and Panda explain the current situation to Hikari and Kirara, and Hikari is surprised that Gojo has been sealed. A Kogane appears, saying how a new rule had been applied to the Culling Games, and that would allow other players to see the name, points, and which colony they are in on the Kogane. It's revealed a Culling Game player named Kashimo Hajime already gained 100 points and they are looking for Sukuna. Another Culling Game player is introduced as well, and that is a lawyer named Higuruma Hiromi. Anyways, they plan out where to find the angel, 
which Master Tengen mentioned in order to unseal Satoru Gojo, with Hikari and Panda heading for Colony No. 2 in Tokyo and Yuji and Megami who will head to Colony No. 1 as Kirara stays on standby outside of the barriers. The next day Maki returns to the Zenin clan household, meeting with Naoya and then heading downwards to the warehouse, witnessing her father Ogi Zenin standing around a pool of blood from her twin sister Mai. Maki and her father then commence their battle, but Maki is overpowered and heavily wounded. That's when Mai makes the decision to sacrifice herself so that Maki can gain her full power and potential. Since birth their abilities have been split due to them being twins. Once Mai makes this sacrifice, we are introduced to the very new Maki Zenin, paralleling that of Toji. She goes on to kill every single person in the Zenin clan, whether it be low grade sorcerers or grade 1 sorcerers. She goes full Itachi mode and kills everyone. Her mother even kills Naoya, but Maki leaves after massacring the entire Zenin clan all by herself. 12 pm November 12th, 2018. Yuji and Megami enter Tokyo Colony No. 1, and Hikari and Panda enter Tokyo Colony No. 2, solidifying their entry into the culling games. As Megami and Yuji enter, they are assigned their own Koganes, with their goal to collect information from Higuruma, who is one of the highest scoring in Tokyo Colony No. 1. They must find modern sorcerers like themselves to exchange information about the culling games, but if they were to come into contact with a sorcerer from the past, it could get dangerous, due to the fact that sorcerers from the past made a binding vow with Kenjaku and how they just want to kill. As Yuji and Megami enter the colony, they are then split from one another, with them being spawned at different locations. Yuji is then attacked by a woman using a flying jet on her back, but meets a person who knew him back in his middle school days. This is the same time that Megami meets a girl named Remy and defeats her. Remy playing around with Megami, he gets pissed off which scares her as he says that he isn't Yuji and that he wouldn't mind gaining 100 points by himself. Megami follows Remy where she tells him about Higuruma's supposed location which is apparently in Shinjuku, but Remy then lures Megami to a man named Reggie as they both then prepare to fight. Reggie explains how he believes that cursed energy from the players inside the colonies is not going to be used for the ritual between Master Tengen and humanity, but he reckons it's a bluff, saying that he believes that the collective cursed energy is going to be used for for a second or third plan. He also says that Kenjaku could drop a massive bomb in terms of something powerful when only the strong ones are left, as Reggie plans on gathering as many strong sorcerers as he can, realising that once Kenjaku gives off this massive incoming bomb, then the culling games would then have served its purpose. That's when Megami just doesn't care and gets ready to attack Reggie, however one of Reggie's underlings attacks Megami from behind. Megami easily shrugs him off, however another culling game player arrives to help Reggie out, and that is a man named Iori Hazanoki, who has already already gained 35 points. Megami saves Remy from an oncoming attack, as he understands Hazanoki is using bomb-like attacks using gasoline. It's then revealed that Reggie currently has 41 points. The other underling Megami used his new one, reappears as his name is Chuzuru Hari, who has accumulated 28 points. Megami then hears the announcement that points can now be transferred. Realising that Yuji had completed his task, Megami then kills Chuzuru, gaining 5 points, and then facing off against Reggie and Hazanoki at the same time. When Hazanoki is about to strike, Takaba who was introduced earlier as a comedian, comes in and saves Megami. He currently has 0 points. Takaba then takes on Hazanoki, whilst Megami takes on Reggie. Long story short, Megami manages to push Reggie into a corner with his domain expansion. Megami then ultimately defeats and kills Reggie, gaining another 5 points. Whilst that fight was going on, just before Yuji headed for Higuruma's location, after being guided by his former classmate, he then comes face to face with Higuruma, as his curse technique is summoning a Shikigami called Judgeman, and what his curse technique is, it's called Deadly Sentencing, which creates a small courtroom domain, meaning this curse technique is already linked to his domain expansion. Anyways, Judgeman who is the Shikigami who oversees the trial. The defendant must prove his innocence to the Shikigami, but Higuruma can counter by making an argument with the evidence shown before them. And just a little side note, Judgeman knows everything of the defendant once they enter this mini domain. However, if this defendant is guilty, they lose control of the cursed energy. Yuji then gets entrapped into this courtroom with Higuruma and is then guilty when he claims that he went to the pachinko parlor to go to the bathroom. Yuji loses control of his cursed energy, granting Higuruma the chance to attack Yuji physically. After some time of fighting, Yuji asks for another trial. He was then asked by Judge Man if Yuji is guilty of committing a mass murder in Shibuya, to which Yuji pleads guilty. Yuji is then given the death penalty by Judge Man, forcing Higuruma to use his executioner's sword, but Yuji manages to land a hit on him. That's when Higuruma stops and tells Yuji 
he'll give Yuji his 100 points, since it was the doing of Sukuna and not him. He also grew fond of Yuji. Yuji then uses Higuruma's 100 points to add a rule which allows players to transfer points to each other. I know that this isn't within the timeline and is a bit off, but I wanted to carry out after explaining Yuji and Megumi's experience in the second Tokyo colony, well at Sendai City at 12.28am, 32 minutes before Yuji, Megumi, Panda and Hikari entered their respective colonies, we are reintroduced to Yuta Akatsu. Also, Satoru Gojo has now been sealed inside of the prison realm for 12 days. Chapter 173 reintroduces us to Yuta Akatsu, who had just killed off Dhruv Lakdawala, as he had 91 points and the other three powerhouses of the Sendai colony were shown, the first one being Ryu Ishigori, who accumulated 77 points, and Uro Takako, who gained 70 points. The last one is called Kuro Rushi, who is actually a cursed spirit from Kenjaku's cursed spirit manipulation, as he's gained 54 points. It is then revealed that Yuta has managed to accumulate 35 points in the Sendai colony, which he entered. Yuta can then be seen guiding civilians and trying his best to get them out of the colony, but that's when he is attacked by Kuro Rushi. This cockroach cursed spirit puts up a fight, but Yuta manages to defeat it, gaining another 5 points to his name. Yuta then comes up against Uro Takako, who is one of the three highest scoring sorcerers in the Sendai colony, as she can manipulate the sky to advantage. Attacking Yuta, she explains that she is a sorcerer who was from the past, and how she can't wait to be given the chance of a second life under Kenjaku's new world. Takako then asks Yuta if he's one of the Fujiwara, probably talking about Sugawara Michizane, but then exclaiming to Yuta, what would one of your blood know about it? That's when Ryu gets involved giving off his granite blast. Yuta understands he's in a bit of a pickle, due to Rika protecting the civilians at the stadium, he decides to go for Ryu first. As he evades his attacks, Yuta gets up close and personal. Surprisingly, Yuta is overpowered by Ryu, as it's been noted that Ryu does indeed have more curse energy output than Yuta. Takako then joins in, forcing Yuta into a corner. This is where Yuta decides to pull out the famous engagement ring given by Rika and awakens all of Rika's full power. From the latest chapters, the three have now given off all three domain expansions at one go, and it'll most definitely be the most craziest fight in Jujutsu Kaisen so far. Well, that was everything in Jujutsu Kaisen set in order as told by the dates and times of the series. I know that there may be some events which I may have missed out, but Jujutsu Kaisen is such an intricate series. I love the way Akutu Tommy based this series on different dates and times, giving us an abnormal structure of this series, giving ourselves a puzzle to figure, and I can proudly say I've figured out most of it so far. There is still so much of this series left. As this series continues and when it does reach its climax, I'll be sure to make a part 2 to this video. With what's going on currently with Yuta, we can understand Jujutsu Kaisen will be making a full circle soon. All the mysteries behind Sukuna, Yuji, Megumi, and Nobara we hope is revealed soon. The Shibuya incident arc spanned for more than a year in our timeline, but it's honestly crazy to know that with a year's worth of content provided by Akutami, only 12 days have passed since Gojo's sealing into the prison realm. When you think about it, it's insane. This was the biggest video I've ever done, as you guys can tell I'm completely drained but it was totally worth it. Now I can look back at this video if I'm ever confused, but what do you guys think about how certain events unraveled? Be sure to let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. This was a massive video to say the least, but I hope you all enjoyed it. This was almost 3 weeks in the making, so be sure to like this video. I would really appreciate that. Also subscribe to the channel if you're new and I'll see you guys in the next one.